Good evening, am I ever happy to have you with me. It is 7.15 on December the 20th, it is almost Christmas, and uh, I've got to tell you a whole bunch, but I'm going to try and keep these videos to about 5 to 10 minutes, and they're going to be segregated for different uh, target audiences. And the first one that this is going to go for is um, just telling my story, okay? you got to get out there and tell your testimony just so that everybody knows you're uh, doing things the right way. Todd White said it best, you know, have you ever seen Todd White in his fire-filled life, man? And he's got the Holy Spirit in him just like I do, and I tell you, that Holy Spirit comes in you, baby, he's like, watch out, bad guys, because ain't nothing stopping me, nothing to knock me down. Anyway, he says you got to get your testimony out there first. He says a great example of this, he saw this, like, pretty attractive-looking girl working out in the gym one morning, he's working out, and, you know, he went up and talked to her, and he, and he, he had a, a premonition or something, and he, something like God spoke to him, he could see this woman's pain. And when he, when he walked up to her, he says, first thing you do is you got to tell your story because the minute some guy walks up to a girl, a good-looking girl in the gym and starts like blah, 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 chatting, uh, her mind is going to be thinking something way different and maybe her boyfriend's over there and his mind's going to be thinking something way different so you got to get your testimony out there right away. So here's my testimony. Okay, I'm 44 years old. I'm a Canadian-born dude, born in Calgary, raised on a farm in Saskatchewan, a small farm. Grew up in a town of 300 people. I had three students in my grade 6 class. That's right, three students, one girl, two guys. Okay, when I was in grade six, I still had one teacher for grade one to grade six, and they still read to us. She still read to us. She cut me cheese, and I had my own pillow for nap time after lunch, okay? Now, when I went to grade seven, and I had classes, different classes the whole damn day for like from 8.30 to 3.30, uh, after an hour and a half bus ride there and an hour and a half bus ride home, I was like, where's my nap time? Where's my cheese? What's with all these subjects? <sighs> anyway, I did good in school, okay? School was never one of the things that I had a problem with. Um, Anyway, I'm gonna, no, I can't take this off. I'm in a library. I gotta, I gotta, you gotta, but we get so many goddamn rules. It's kind of like our rights right now, you know, where the rights are more powerful than what's right. And that's gonna be get a little into my story. So, um, grew up on the farm when I was uh, 18. So I left home when my dad said, under my roof, my rules kind of thing, when he saw me and my best friend's tattoo that I'd had for just about three years. And I said, well, fuck you, I ain't living by your goddamn rules. So I grabbed my bags, my ship threw it in a plastic garbage bag and started walking down the highway. I walked 100 kilometers to the next town and uh, found a, a, a good a couple, an elderly couple, and uh, they said, hey, he, he lost. I said, no, I'm looking for a place to go to school. I gotta finish grade 12. And they said, where do you live? I said, I don't know. And uh, so he took me in, and uh, yeah, it was an amazing. Graduated in top of my class. Um, in spite of being at a rival town, that was a little bit tough, but you know what, they ended up liking me after there anyway. Um, and then went to university. Went to university, invited my parents. So I, did, I did invite my parents to my graduation. They were so pumped and proud that they thought I was going to jail or something like that because I was a badass, da 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 you know, even though I never had less than 90 and nothing in school. But um, anyway, got to uh, university. My dad said, you got to go be an accountant. I said, Dad, I fucking hate accounting. Like, I hate it. He's like, yeah, but you're good at it. You, like, you get 100 in math all the time. He's like, you got to do it. I'm like, yeah, but I hate it. And he's like, I don't care. You need to go be an accountant. So I went for three years. And uh, in my third year, I was like, Dad, like, this sucks. I was like, OK, what do you want to do? I was like, Dad, I told you I want to take over the farm. Like, I always wanted to take over the farm. Now, he didn't let me take over the farm right away because I think he had to take it over when he was 13 years old when his dad died of a heart attack. And so he was also a very smart man, but I think he was always a little bit envious and kind of jealous that he never had the opportunity to go to post-secondary school because he could have, and he would have done really well. Um, anyway, third year, he said to Kate, you want to take over the farm? Well, your mom and I are going to take off for the weekend. You know how to use a computer. You know how to read books now. Here's the books. You can take a look at the books. They came back that weekend, and I said, what in the hell have you guys been doing hanging on to this farm for so damn long? I can't believe you guys have been losing this much money and been taking care of us this well. Like, my God, you guys got to sell. Like, I don't want nothing to do with this. So that summer, they had a, um, a farm auction. It was one of the first ones out in our region, and they then moved to Airdrie, Alberta, or in that Calgary area. And finally, it was good. You know, they made a lot of money on their... They didn't make a lot of money on the farm, but they did okay. And then they made a lot of money on their house there, and then they got to move one more time, moved out to the Okanagan here, and they... I uh, lived in their retirement uh, gated dream home um, until dad died of a heart attack. And he died on a Friday after he bought a first his Mustang convertible, first convertible he bought for like 40 years. He had a steak. Pretty sure him and his mom had sex that night and he had a heart attack. So, you know, pretty good way to go at 65 years of age. And uh, anyway, so 
uh, I've been homeless ever since we sold the farm, but uh, I started a trucking company, drove truck, uh, pulling Super Bs, Western Canada, you know, mainly bulkers, that kind of thing. Uh, did some custom combining in the States, um, and then uh, listened to CBC a lot, and I heard about the nursing shortage, uh, and looked into the nursing degree, and I'm like, wow, that's a pretty well-rounded degree. So I went back to University of Saskatchewan, and I got my nursing degree. Finished uh, the four-year degree in three years, and I was one of the first and the only students to go and do their practicum in the Northern Territories. I'm talking far, and I fly in kind of stuff. Um, did that, worked up there for a year, saw stuff that you're never ever going to be able to forget and stuff that I don't ever want to uh, say just because it is that horrific up there. Um, but uh, then moved down to the Okanagan and started doing emergency room work with travel nursing and uh, just hated the unions, hated the unions. They're so supportive of mediocrity and you know, I, I hear all this healthcare workers, da 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 da, such you know, blah blah blah, it's like come on, really? You want to see healthcare work? Let me take you to Asia and show how the healthcare system functions and how they really pump people through. And they do it with professionalism. They do it with kindness. They do it with diplomacy. They don't do it with arrogance and that big old union power behind their back. You know, and don't get me wrong, they do some great things here, but they hate that we're putting them up on that pedestal like the shit don't stink. That ain't for me. I'll tell you that right now. Anyway, uh, when I went to Asia uh, for a baptism, I went for two weeks. I stayed for 10 years, came back with a wife and two kids. I could speak Chinese like a mofo. And I started a school over there with three students who grew it up to 350 students. I got into vehicle uh, detailing. I got into a paint shop. I learned how to do business over there. And they do business the right way. They do business by looking people in the eyes. They do business with a handshake and they do it around a table eating food. Okay, you know, it's, it's proper business. And, and they're fast and they're nimble. That's why, you know, Indian Asia are taking over the world. Anyway, that's where I say I became born again. So Akai, my other name, is uh, where I was born in, in Taiwan. Okay, and uh, that's where my oldest boy is. That's where my two uh, boys and wife are right now. I miss him to death. I haven't seen him for over seven months, and I wish to have you know. I, uh, it's it's crazy, man. But uh, now we can get into the shit because we moved back to Canada about ten years ago. Uh, I went to, back to Saskatchewan, where I was born and raised. Started at sixty thousand dollars. I doubled my salary every year ever since then, and I said I would. And I was on par for a four million dollar year when I decided I was like. Screw this, I'm done chasing money. I saw some bad experiences at the kitchen table from my boy, and I was like, that's a direct result of not having a father figure in his life. So I was like, Phew, done. Gave my notice the next day, and guess what? The big dog wouldn't take my notice. So they continued to pay me for months and months and months. And it's like, you ready? You ready? You take some time, take some time. I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm, I'm not chasing money anymore. I'm here to spend time with my wife and kids, and, and I'm here to be a motivator. I'm here to like be a business consultant. I'm here to help inspire people to live their life to the fullest potential that they can be, because that is my biggest pain. My biggest pain is when I see 97% of the people of the world that can only control about 3% of the wealth, I see them walking around like walking zombies. They are the sheeple, okay, sheeple. And COVID is great for sheeple. Like, you know that the whether can COVID is man-made or, you know, here to control population or not, or it's just a virus that got out of control like a flu, it doesn't really flip and matter. It's here. Don't worry about the stupid questions. Worry about the now what. And the now what questions is, even if those technology, or those booster shots got 5G technology and they can just hit a button and kill a whole bunch of people, guess what? If 97% of the population don't know their value proposition, if they don't know what they're worth, if they don't know what they bring to the table in this game called life, they're worthless. Maybe we got too many of worthless people. And trust me, I think we do. Uh, anyway, so um, gave my notice there, tried to buy a mountain, and Sycamus got my first uh, professional corporate loss handed to me by some rope-a-dope uh, holding companies that have a history of screwing people, selling at easement and some shady land deals that uh, stuff I'd never heard of in Saskatchewan. They taught me a lesson here. And then uh, found ourselves looking for a place to live, homeless, uh, school was coming up, and I said, Kelowna. I said, this place is pumping. It's got an entrepreneurial vibe, unlike anything. I'm like, the food, the people, the lifestyle, the health, I'm like, the, the, the quality, I'm like, it, it, this is it. It's the place. It's got the entrepreneurial vibe. And um, so we moved here and decided to call it home. Now. Uh, we were homeless for a year until we found our house, and then that minute we found that house, I was like, boom, that's it, and we got it, and it came to us December 22nd, I think is when we got possession of it, and it was just like, yes, we knew it, and it was set up to have like, uh, it's almost like a duplex, and we were going to have one side a bed and breakfast, and then the other side for us, but we were going to maybe go back to Taiwan for the summers and have them both run as bed and breakfasts, so the, the, basically the property would pay for itself. Um, and it had to do a little bit of work, and I was trying to make it a little quieter, so there's a little bit less sound transferring between the two units. But um, did really, really good uh, as far in far terms of the construction, and uh, we loved the property. It was amazing, and uh, I actually called the bed and breakfast heaven. Didn't get it registered yet, but we, I called it heaven. And let me tell you how heaven turned into hell. 
Okay, so um, I don't know if you've heard much about the human trafficking industry or the fentanyl industry in the Okanagan. I mean, Okanagan or Kelowna, but it is massive. And let me tell you how long it takes for a daughter or a girl to become an escort. Four days, six days. Four to six days, usually from a boyfriend or a husband, um, they get put into a basement or a trailer down the street not too far from where I live, and they get force-fed uh, down, they call it, which they say is heroin, which is not any of it's heroin, it's all just fentanyl. And then they get raped and gang raped and nothing, fed nothing other than drugs. After that fourth day, they're hooked, they're totally numb, and they give them a few days to kind of just make sure they stay numb, but they can eat. And then by about fifth, sixth day, they're good enough to go to the hotel rooms. They go there, they bill, the, bill them online for like 200 to $300 an hour, and that girl probably takes home maybe, I don't know, 50% of that, but she's probably using that much uh, in drugs to feed her addiction, to just keep the pain numb, to keep doing what she's doing. So I heard about this and I didn't like it. No, I'm like, that ain't right. I ain't got a daughter, but I'm like, that ain't right. But I don't focus on the bullshit. I don't focus on the problems. I focus on solutions. And I was listening to some news, and Pornhub was talking about having to upgrade their servers as a result of COVID because of the amount of porn that's going watching and being watched online right now. And I'm like, well, let me look into this. And I look on these online sex shows, and I started looking at the costs and the pricing and the users and the, and the social media marketing and the taglines. And I'm like doing the numbers, and I'm like, oh my God. If a girl worked for like four hours, maybe six hours a day doing this, she could make as much money in about two weeks from the comfort of her own home as if she worked 20 hours a day out of a hotel for these fucking pimps for two months without being on drugs, without having a risk of disease or being abused. I gotta help these people. And uh, that's probably where I went wrong. Because you can't help everybody and uh, some people aren't ready to be helped. And any part of change is gonna be a progression of up and down. But needless to say, from me helping a few girls find an alternative way to make money and be clean, I'm saying the only condition is if you're going to live here for nothing and get yourself cleaned up or whatever in that bed and breakfast suite. You know, if you can afford to pay this much, you pay that much. Uh, and uh, you set the price, I don't care. But uh, the pimps ain't coming. And, you know, I'm not going to say uh, you got to be abstinent or anything like that, but you ain't gonna be the cracker, kind of strung out looking grease ball that I see walking down the street all the time. You gotta clean yourself up, make yourself look presentable. And I'll help you with the laptop, I'll help you with technology, I'll help you with cryptocurrency if you need that. But uh, this is a stepping stone for you to get yourself set up, reestablished, and then get the fuck out. Um, it must have been kind of successful because I can tell you something that a big rat doesn't like. The big rat doesn't like when you start taking away its cheese. And that's when I decided to help these other two people. One of them who I heard the four day story of being raped and da 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 da. I said, yeah, 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 I can help you out. And, you know, you're smart. You're just about finished your psychology degree. You got one year left and you fell into drugs. I can help you out. Da, da, da. Yeah, sure, your friend, dude. I can help her out too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you guys a place to live. You know, you gotta like maybe help me clean or something like that. And I, I'm like, I don't know what you want to do. I don't know what you like to do, but you gotta find it. Like, this ain't a free hotel forever kind of thing. Like, I, somebody's gotta pay the bills around this fucking place. And so, um, I was gonna hire one of them to manage my bed and breakfast when I was gonna go back and see my wife and kids. And the only reason my wife and kids aren't here is because uh, I started realizing that this town's fucking pretty shitty. When um, on my boy's first day of school in grade three. Uh, a kid in his grade was rushed to the hospital comatose and they didn't decide to give him Narcan until 6 o'clock that night because he found something on the floor called poor man's heroin yeah anyway uh, that amongst a whole host of other things that the human eye should never have to see and you see it all the time in the city Kelowna and I'm telling you that's why I'm here I'm here to help because I've got solutions I've got solutions because the reason this place going like this is because we let it 
and potential in express terms of power. Alright, so my office is gonna close in 30 minutes, so I'm gonna put this one up there and just call it good. Anyway, that's my story. These squatters moved into my house and have taken my net worth from about three and a half million dollars down to probably negative who knows what. I've been homeless for just about six weeks. Yes, I've had a few nights in a hotel here and there. Um, and I had some food given to me and I have been um, born again in a way that you could never imagine. The Holy Spirit now moves through me and I tell you, I see nothing other than opportunities and beauty and success in the way that the world was made to happen. And I know every person here is live, designed to live like a hero, a genius, and a legend. And that's why I'm telling you my story because I've got some opportunities. But the opportunities that I have are kind of like the war that we're in between good and evil. And it is a war. These aren't opportunities where you get to sink, think about and scratch your chin and wonder, oh, do I, do I, do I, do I, oh no, I need my eight hours of sleep, or wait, I gotta drink my eight glasses of water. Hell no, baby, that ain't the way warrior goes to war. Okay, in less than 12, 48 hours, I probably am gonna lose another 20 grand on my house because my house is so disgustingly fucking trashed. I'm talking needles, drugs, human excrement. It is absolutely destroyed. And I have a $20,000 cleanup fee. Um, if I can't get it clean by then. But you know what, I believe good things are gonna happen. Because I make them happen. But that is my story. Now I wanna get to shutting this one down at 16 minutes because I'm gonna do 10 minutes about the opportunities I have, what I'm looking for, and uh, give permission to share as you will However, don't ever give me something for nothing. I'm not here for sympathy. My dad always used to say, you know where sympathy is? It's somewhere in the middle of shit and syphilis in the dictionary, and I don't want all three of them. And I would agree, I ain't here for sympathy. Okay, if I'm asking you for something, trust me, I'm gonna pay you back with something. It might not be money, it might be something different, but I always wanna give you greater value than you give me. Anyway, you can call me Craig, you can call me Akai. You can call me that guy that drove across Canada this summer, last summer in a pink banana hammock for mental health and Canadian local business screaming boom shakalaka at the top of his lungs as I tried to help a young Jehovah, fam uh, Jehovah Witness family who'd been uh, screwed out of everything as a result of COVID and their travel um, plans. Um, or you can call me one. And if you want, just call me brother. It does not matter. But I'm here for you. Boom, shakalaka. Welcome to the church now.